Hello. Hello. Hello, Rodrigo. Hola, David. Thank you very much, very, very much uh, for having us, for having Almoceu uh, in this conversation. We're calling it Dialogos in the Studio. Uh, some of the conversations will be in the studio, some will not. With you, uh, we'll have you in the studio. Um, so maybe if you can just introduce yourself briefly uh, and share a little bit of uh, about where you are uh, and how has you know your last days been. Um, I'm David Antonio Cruz. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a painter and performance artist. Um, my work, my practice is really much about queer, brown, black bodies, really dealing with the community um, and its history. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, two parents that had moved from Puerto Rico in the 1970s. And the work living in that environment really much affected my work. About 20, when I was around 20, I moved to New York and I've been in New York for about 25 years making work. And the last two years I've been spending my time between Boston and New York. Um, of course, the last few days have been quite um, challenging for most of us um, in the community and outside of the community. And so it's been a time really for me to slow down and reflect and to think about my practice, think about my community, how to keep us moving forward and support each other. So it's been an interesting time. It's really the time to really think, um, slow down, reflect, thinking about a lot about the work that I've been making, why I make the things that I make. And so um, a lot of reflection, a lot of reflecting lately, yes. Um, I'm just curious, I was uh, speaking with, uh... A dear friend of mine the other day, another artist, uh, painting by coincidence, and she said, you know, like finally humanity caught up with me because I've been I've been painting in my studio re in reclusion for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 plus years. Uh, I know you're also a professor and um, I know you've been teaching online. Uh, so how just this new situation have just uh, impacted on your you know daily routine or in your you know working method uh, in terms of painting and teaching and having the two things at the same space right now it's it's been challenging i i realized that i couldn't do my zoom classes within my studio i just thought it was a little too much of um painters and well pretty much i mean most artists we do spend a lot of time by ourselves we enjoy that it's it's you know at times um it is definitely by choice because you need some time to reflect think process um, and of course we create incredible messes in our studios and so that space is very sacred and then all of a sudden that space becomes very open for people to view in or asking permission to see into it and so that's been quite a little bit challenging um, I of course I was lucky because I had a shipment of a lot of materials coming before this happened and so I was in the process of working on these bodies of work and so I'm lucky enough to have materials and have access to my studio. A lot of artists do not have access to their space, which is really challenging because like, this is how we make our living, but it's, it's, this is our soul. This is how we, we stay alive, we breathe through our work. And so I'm, I'm lucky in that way. Teaching, however, it's been a little bit more challenging. Um, one is that, you know, I, my hopes are always to create a space that allow my students to really experiment and try new things. And it's it's somewhat casual. We have these ongoing conversations and that had to be completely uprooted and students had to go home. And so that community that I created, it's really hard somewhat to translate when students are home. And so it's been um, a challenge trying to figure out a way for them to feel safe and feel productive and feel inspired. Um, and so I'm, you know, it's a little harder. It's more um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations and um, it's a little more emotional. It, it's quite change how my interactions with my students. I, I want to make sure that they're, they're safe and it's quite hard to make artwork when, you know, we're in the situation that we are. And um, 
I mean, our goal is are constantly is to really think and examine about, you know, how structures are created and we question those things and here we are. And it's flipping back and forth and trying to figure out what can I do as an artist to have a positive impact or change or reflect what's going on. And so um, when you have students that are trying to uh, just understand what it is to be an artist, it's quite challenging when they're put in this position, what to do next and how, um, when they're just learning to let go. I, th I guess there's one thing that is very much recurring to everyone now. It's this, um, you, 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 you talked a little bit about that just now, which is this private space becoming more so a public space or shared space. And I, I want to, you know, just use this notion as an excuse to shift the conversation towards the project you were preparing for Freeze and Alagos, uh, which I think it has to do with that. You, I know you've been doing a lot of research and I know uh, in terms of images online and how people are just, you know, constructing their identities and exposing themselves constantly uh, in this sort of through this digital presence. I've seen your beautiful show at Monique Meloche uh, and last fall, but also the presentation you had about the same body of work around the same body of work at the Brooklyn Museum. So maybe if you can just, you know, using this moment just to share with us a little bit about the project you were preparing for Freeze. Sure. Um, um, the project is um, part of the series title, We Give So Much and Give Nothing at All. And it's looking at the systematic violence against queer bodies, particularly trans bodies, gender non-conforming bodies, brown, black, and specific. Um, and so there, the pieces are pretty much portrait style. It takes on language of like celebrity culture, fashion, high society, these ideas of lushness. And for this project, I was looking at um, John Singer Sargent's like high society portraits and thinking about these private spaces and public spaces of luxury. And so um, in it, the paintings, um, all four paintings were large in scale and were being installed on a painted background. And so the painted background was a form uh, biomorphic um, elongated trees that really looks at um, the history of the U.S. and lynching and killings of um, black bodies. And so um, the portraits themselves were um, the largest one, which ranged from six by eight feet, was of the Maryland girls, women that have been murdered in Maryland the last three years. It also included the what I call the Detroit kids. And they were friends, uh, young, they were about um, 20 years old, 21 years old, and all friends that were murdered, queer and trans, were murdered by one um, Salem, and also included a piece by, of um, Kevin Fret, who is, um, was an upcoming trap um, artist from Puerto Rico who was gunned down last year. So a lot of this project was looking at the youth, young folks within the queer community, the next, the rising of, and the ending and lynching of these bodies. And so um, aside from the paintings and the painted wall, I was including um, a couch-like piece that is fractured and broken, reassembled. And um, I kind of call it the, the queerifying of the sofa. And I'm constantly rearranging bodies and limbs and furniture, kind of thinking about how to create a body that really talks about who we are, this, this, the next level, the next space. And so um, the couch had multiple legs, about eight legs, um, curving and moving. And the piece was upholstered in this beautiful velvet fabric that was a print from one of my backgrounds of one of the paintings. And so it also has these little birds, which really talking about um, queer language, um, Spanish and English and playing with that. So David, this, this paintings that we see in the back, are they part of this presentation? Yeah, these are part of the presentation. Um, the one directly behind me is of the Detroit kids. And so 
Um, they're forged together almost really much like the cover of a Vogue magazine, ready for their um, snapshot, their close up. And so um, they're dressed in incredible uh, fashion pieces, pieces that I'm constantly mining from the internet, looking at um, the role of fashion and celebrity culture and this idea that we place so much value in, on beauty and clothes. And I wanted to snap and pull that out and allow the the community to live in that space, you know, in the space and maybe that we would consider them differently, and look and pause um, and see us differently. Because so much of that, it's really much about that idea of value. Who has value? Who is looked at? Who is, um, who's saved? Who's considered, you know? and so much of the press and, and so much of the media around the community has been one of pushing back or misgendering or not really considering the pain of someone who has been lost and um, somewhat dehumanizing mm -hmm. of our body. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to allow us to exist in this space where you have to consider it. You have to well, What about the, this, this beautiful gray design backdrop, so this background? Do they have like patterns or I remember some of the paintings I've seen, they have this beautiful floral patterns that are really resembling or like, I think, royalness or, or this yeah. lavish environment that you were referring to. There's so much about us that sometimes we are, you know, this idea of coming out, you know, of being hidden, you know, you come out into your own. And so all of the paintings are, the bodies are posed in these grayish landscapes that kind of play up this idea of shadow, of coming out into your own light. And um, I'm fascinated by architecture, I'm fascinated by landscape. and. Although it is something that I don't quite paint like an ideal landscape, but I do mention locations um, and environment. And so the vegetation around some of the paintings are directly from the area where the people are from. So it's hoping to root them in this space, this um, neighborhood. For this series, um, for this extension of the body of work, I started adding trees. I was thinking really much about that root, this idea of growth. And of course, of that idea of lynch, lynching, um, that we don't really think or consider bodies being like queer bodies in that way. But um, it is part of that history. It is part of the way that we've been, you know, been massacred and not being considered um, and addressed or be, and these crimes not being solved. And so the backgrounds themselves are shades of gray. And so it, they're, um, they're shadowy spaces. You know, and so they they um, they range from leaves and flowers to little birds to trees, and it's really much about the landscape, the environment they all come from, and and you know each of the paintings are in different shades of gray, and then they're washed down to kind of erase the edge or the line, and the bodies kind of fall in back in and out of. Yeah. And I guess a very important thing is also the face, right? I think in every portrait, but uh, especially I, I remember several of your works that I've seen this uh, out of this recent body of work, the face has a very important role in the narrative or in the way we perceive the these figures or these bodies. And I guess the face now with this whole virus situation it became a very threatening thing, you know? I think the face, the way we expose our faces, don't touch your face, you have to cover your face. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit about the yeah, I mean, face. Our, our faces are a form of identification. You know, it's how we pretty much express how we feel. It's the one thing that reveals our inner thoughts. You know, we, you know, when we're sad, we cry. It's something that you see through your face. We smile. It's something that reflects through our face. You know, um, also during this time period, we've we've constructed new identities. We play where our faces to construct these new identity. You know, forms of being, kind of like this queer alien idea. And um, right now, it's quite fascinating to me that we're you know we're asking us to shield 
the face, you know, to shield, to conceal, mask, you know. And for a while, I was creating part of this body of work. Um, some of the paintings really talked about the idea of masking and shielding mm -hmm. and I, as a form of protection, a way to obscure identity or, or seek safety because, you know, um, away from being scanned or policed, you know, in a way to find safety. And so here we are, you know, at this place where we're being asked to cover it. And it's been something that I, I you know, the face is such, you know, we have an attachment to eyes and noses and lips and, you know, this is how we express ourselves and um, we talk about beauty, you know, um, and, you know, the last few years, that's been something of questioned, you know, being identified by your skin, your face, being policed that way. And some of the works were about masking. They were also about this idea of the helmet, the future body, a queer future Latin black body that I was thinking about a space of safety for us. Um, and so much, I play a lot with language, you know, and pajaritos being one, mm -hmm. um, little birds, um, this idea of the alien, you know, being labeled alien. And what does that look like? And what if we are able to own it and transform and think of ourselves and our bodies of the future, you know, one in, of beyond, we transcend this space of oppression and policing. And so it's been something I've been thinking about, especially that was something that I started bringing up a lot at the show in Chicago. Um, the second half of the, the exhibition was really much about looking at immigration and that crossing with queer trans bodies and 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 AIDS and how the complication of those things and, and I was thinking about what happens if we transcend the space what happens if we move forward um, and we own that space we become the future mm -hmm. and so although facially I want some sense of remembrance of holding on to a life a soul, a space, a light. Um, the bodies are are fixed or broken and altered, almost preparing us to push forward, go ahead. Um, it's not worldly anymore. They're green, they're purple, they're, you know, they've taken on a different role that this is not of this time. And um, it's it's been something to think about lately, you know, especially as you know, having to wear masks. Um, also, you know, um, how, how it's been affecting some of the communities. The idea that, you know, historically, you know, masking is a way of like um, calling out a criminal. This idea of like of um, safety, you know, obscuring yourself can mean something danger. So yeah, the black bandit, and all of a sudden becomes you know, a sign of healthy and care and safety and sort of protection. Uh, but I mean, historically, we have all these associations of the mask with the outlaw, with, yes. with um, some with you know, activity. So it's very interesting, this ambiguity, how this ambiguity in the face is really playing out now. Yeah, it's, you know, it's like, who gets that? Who gets to be obscure? Who gets to be safe? And you know, and right now there's there's been complaints across the country where you know people are being policed and being asked to uncover themselves because you know they want to be able to see who it is. I mean, this has also been something that been debated for a long time concerning certain religion and and you know. Um, clothing and certain countries have outlawed folks from being you know covered up and shield and um and masking is something that it's been debated constantly and you know we project this idea of evil or mischief onto someone and now we're having to redirect that and think about safety but still again there's questions about who gets to be safe who gets not to be questioned in a public space when they're just trying to survive or be safe for us and others. And so um, 
Yeah, it's, you know, this idea of masking and face and it's one that I'm just, I'm constantly thinking, how do you reveal all? How do you hide all? How do you play a role? Just your face, the idea that it, 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 it releases and exposes everything, you know, your, your inner thoughts. And then also project that on a painting that allows someone to come in and fall into it and be a part of it. Okay, so David, I also know that uh, you've been uh, in a NAS file at El Museo del Barrio, one of the first ones, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and I know you, 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 know, you have a, some years of relationship with the museum. So if you can just, you know, uh, when we had the, the think tank where we host you at the museum, you say something very beautiful about El Museo as the house for uh, a lot of the, the Latino artists and curators and, and just artistic community in the U.S. I think this idea is very interesting. So if you can just, you know, tell us a little bit about your relationship with El Museo, that would be great. Sure. I, I do think of it as house, it's home, um, especially for a lot of the Latinx artists in New York City and throughout. Um, for me, it's been quite incredible. My relationship with El Museo, it's longstanding. It started quite a long time ago, about 2005, 2006. Deborah Collins and Mickey Garcia curated me into the S-Files, which was really an incredible platform. People were able to see the Hibata work, works that were loud and lush. There were self-portraits of me just really um, thinking about ideas of, machismo, masculinity, and my role as a queer person within the Latin community. And soon after, a couple of years later, the largest piece from that collection, the Puerto Rican Pieta, became part of the permanent collection at Museo, which is a portrait of me and my mother. So also, I know that in 2013, you presented a very important uh, performance piece in the theater. Uh, was it a, an opera? Yeah. What was this project? So, Chus Martinez and Rocio Aranga commissioned me to create this performative piece, the opera, The Duende Always Travels Light. And the piece was really my largest presentation at the time and really launched my operatic large scale performances. And um, it was also funded by Franklin Furness and presented during Performer 13. And it brought together about 25 people on stage, a small orchestra. 10 actors, Michelin Thomas, Elia Alba, a jazz singer and an opera singer. And it was quite moving. And so and Museo has been really, really supportive of my practice. And now, of course, free as you can, you know, curating me into this project. And so it's had a really incredible effect on in my work, um, my career, and really bringing my work out constantly into this new platform that has allowed people to see the work. Um, and so it's been quite beautiful. It is definitely what I think home. I do think of it as house and family. And so I've been really, really honored um, to be so kindly welcome for so many years at this point. David, thank you so much. That was a great studio visit. Uh, I hope you continue to be working and safe and healthy in, in Boston. And I hope we continue the dialogue. In the, in the next uh, iterations of our conversation, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this project. It's been quite an honor. And so thank you. Thank you.